My name is Eliah Bushlack. I'm one of the youth interns here at Marion Methodist. Our scripture comes from 1 Corinthians 13. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for Sundays and just how we're able to be here in worship and just be in your presence. And we thank you for your unconditional love that you have for us. And we hope that we can shower others with the same love that you have for us. And we thank you for Pastor Mike. And as you speak through him so we can experience the Holy Spirit and may it enter our hearts. In your heavenly name, amen. Well, I'll join everybody that came before me and welcome all of you to worship at Marion Methodist. Glad you're here. I want to welcome all of you that is part of the growing community of our church online. We're so glad you worship us uh, with us and uh, share time and fellowship um, uh, at Marion Methodist. Uh, you know, uh, we have these two guys wandering around here, one with video camera and one with, uh, uh, you know, a, a still photo camera. And they both contracted with me to put the slimming filter on now Tom can do whatever he wants but Gonzo's got to come back in here tomorrow so he'll have to do what he has to do hi um it would be um inappropriate for me to to begin this conversation with you this morning without really talking for a few moments about what we're all hearing about what we're all thinking about in regards to the holy lands of Israel now the conflict in Israel has been going on for a long time and while we have a lot of geopolitical things that we can think about, that really boils down to the first part of the Old Testament, discerning who is the honored and favored son of Abraham. Is it Ishmael or is it Isaac? Now, we can make a lot of things, and people have over the years, turn that into a great deal of conflict. But until we rewrite that narrative, um, there's always going to be an Israeli-Palestinian problem. Now, while I think it's important for all of us to be well-educated on the matter, uh, to be um, thoughtful in our conversations and not just post out stuff that we may or may not really know about it, because none of us here uh, that I'm aware of are um, experts in Israeli politics uh, or the, the religious situation there. Um, I've been there uh, a handful of times, and I adore the people uh, of Israel, but I also know that the Palestinians... Uh, Christians, Jews, and uh, Hebraic people need to live together. So I thought, guys, goodness sake, when I come before the congreg congregation this morning, how is it that I can be useful in that conversation and the ongoing um, horrors that we're dealing with? And I thought, well, who would know better what to say than three people that are from that area? So what I'm going to, what I'll pray, and I'm going to say in the middle of my prayer, not that God won't, would be informed, he already knows, but that you might know uh, where these prayers are coming for, from. One is from a, a Christian pastor in the region, one from a, a Muslim 
uh, I'm on and one from a rabbi. So if you would, would you collect your heart with mine? Uh, let us pray. From the Christian pastor, God of mercy and compassion, of grace and reconciliation, pour your power upon all your children in the Middle East, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, Palestinians and Israelis. Let hatred be turned into love, fear to trust, despair to hope, oppression to freedom, occupation to liberation, that violent encounters may be replaced by loving embraces and peace and justice could be experienced by all from the Iman. In the name of God, the everlasting merciful, the cherisher of the worlds and, the wor and worthy of all praise, our Lord. You have created us from a single pair of a male and a female and made us into the nations and tribes that we may know one another, not that we may despise each other. So help us to love each other and take the hatred and anger from our hearts so that the people of the book, Christians, Jews, and Muslims in the Middle East may live in peace and justice. And from the rabbi, O God, source of life, creator of peace, help your children anguished and confused to understand the futility of hatred and violence and grant them the ability to stretch across political, religious, and national boundaries so they may confront horror and fear by continuing together in the search for justice, peace, and truth. With every fiber of our being, we beg you, O God, help us neither to fail nor falter. Amen. I encourage you to continue to inform yourself uh, on those matters and to continue to pray for all the people. It's a very small country, 400 miles from end to end, 12 miles wide at the top, but it includes some very precious land and some very wonderful and precious people to God. So pray for peace in Jerusalem and Israel always and now. I... I, I uh, have the privilege of preaching the gospel today which is exciting and and honestly it's a it's a very simplistic sermon because I'm going to take it right from the scriptures today <clears throat> and I and I want to uh, give you a warning so it's always my uh, responsibility to give congregations warnings to what might happen so guys if you'd flip that next slide up I want to see have you to see the Christmas slide because for the third time in my ministry at Marian Methodist Chris, uh, Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday Okay, now listen carefully. I know that on Sunday mornings, like today, it is our habit and regular practice to come to the church on Sunday morning. But on Christmas Eve, we're not going to have any services here in the morning. Oh, I know the horror. <laughs> It'll be okay. Now, if you come on Christmas Eve morning and want to meditate quietly in the cool uh, serenity of our parking lot, you're invited. <laughs> but nobody's going to be in here until after uh, noon a little bit. We're going to have our three services uh, of carols and candlelight at two, four, and six, as you see. So you could start planning around that, which one you might want to uh, attend. And we, we bring your friends, bring your family, and also throughout the afternoon, uh, starting uh, towards the end of the two o'clock service down the hall in room 100, uh, we'll fashion that into a communion chapel and we'll be serving communion so families can go after the two o'clock service and before the other two services. Uh, so make that plan. Today, we are going to fight for your family. This is week five of six in this particular uh, group of teachings. And I, I want to share this story. I heard it this week. <clears throat> it was about a couple. Um, you know, there'd been some stress. You know, he was a little bit overworked uh, at, at, at work. And, and she was starting to wonder. You know, he was kind of stressed out all the time. And, and she thought, gosh, maybe he's got like a, a somebody on the side that he's got like some sort of an affair going on. And so she just decided to bring it to a head, not really in an appropriate way. She, she wrote a, a, a real dear John letter. She said, John, I've had more than I can take. I'm leaving you. And she placed it on the bedroom um, uh, dresser and then to see what his reaction would be rather than leaving she crawled under the bed knowing he was going to come home from work in just a couple of moments and she laid under there and he came home and as was his normal practice he stopped in the kitchen on the way he, she heard the refrigerator door open and then close and then he walked into the bedroom saw the note put his things down saw the note read it and then she could hear him writing something on the note. And then he grabbed his cell phone 
And he said, hey, babe, it's finally happened. Put on that dress that I like so much, and I'll be there in 10 minutes. And he walked out, and she laid under the bed, and she wept, openly wept. She cried, and she shimmied out from under the bed. She went over to the dresser where he'd written the note, and he looked down, she looked down at it, and, she's, and he said, I can see your feet under the bed. We're out of milk. I'll be back in 10 minutes. We are about, in our marriages and in our family lives, we're about staying. And we're about staying really well. And that is why, with everything and all the resources of the church, with all the ministries we have here, we fight for your family. There's always going to be tensions. There's always going to be ups and downs. But we fight for your family. Elia read very well, by the way, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 a moment ago. I want to tell you what leads up to 1 Corinthians 13. I know you'll say, well, yeah, probably chapter 12, Mike. Yes, but in chapter 12, what happens in chapter 12 is Paul expresses all the spiritual gifts that a person might receive from the Holy Spirit, the gift of preaching, the gifts of uh, teaching, the gifts of healing, all those kind of things. And he talks about all those wonderful gifts. And then the last sentence in chapter 12, you should read it something time it said but now I will show you the most excellent way the most excellent way and he goes on and 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 talks about this and writes all of 1 Corinthians 13 but I you know when we look in our families we look at the most excellent way and I know you guys know it so I just got a common video about a little family and and I just want you to see how, how it is we live today so take a look at this Here's my family. This is a family photo we did recently. Um, Not staged, this is just what we do. (laughs) We, We wake up like this. We just go to sleep in our matching fall outfits and wake up with perfect hair. Everything's ideal. Um, The boys are always smiling at their mom. Um, Audrey is always just a joyful, exuberant little girl. Uh, The baby never cries. It's ideal. That's ideal. She also never poops. I never have to change her diaper. She sleeps through the night. Um, Mary and I are always happy with each other. We've got all sorts of different ideas of the ideal. But again, the ideal family isn't so much about the family. The ideal family is all about Christ. So it's just like your family, right? Ideal. See, we know this. Family life isn't quite that perfect. There's a group that does some videos on uh, on YouTube called Mike and Joel, and they said, and I, I don't know anything about the back part of this, but they said, you know, parenting is kind of like being a Navy SEAL. I said, well, I gotta listen to this. They said, well, if you're a Navy SEAL, the last week of your training is called Hell Week. And in the middle of the night, at three o'clock in the morning, you're woke up, people are screaming at you, they're, you're wet because they're throwing water on you and stuff like that, and they're telling you what to do, and it's not even stuff you want to do because you're sound asleep. And they said, how is that different than parenting a three-year-old? You wake up in the middle of the night, they're screaming at you, they want something, and they're wet. <laughs> and I know it's a little bit different, but they said, and, and they end the video by saying, Navy SEALs, it's a week. <laughs> parenting right last and last now I don't know that that's necessarily accurate but but what we want to talk about is not the ideal like you saw in the video or the farcical thing but the most excellent way the realistic most excellent way for your family and I'm going to share two um, texts that I have used many many times at weddings usually picked by the couple And I I saw some of you this morning, and in preparation for this sermon, I looked backwards because my computer stores these kind of things. And some of you that are here today, I used one of these two texts as the basis for your wedding sermon. The first is from 1 Corinthians that we just read. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not arrogant or rude. And I'm sure because I have some of my talks is what we said at that wedding was love felt is never accidental. Love that you feel is never accidental. It just doesn't fall into your lap. So set out on a daily mission 
to make your family know, not just spousal relationships, I'm going to talk about children, family, parents, all that kind of stuff. Set out on a daily mission to make your family know, to make them know beyond a reasonable doubt or beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love them. And so I, I've, I've given that talk many times or, or something similar to that, defining love, because I think uh, 1 Corinthians is a perfect definition of love, 1 Corinthians 13. And there's a second one. And I know that a few of you, because th- th- you've been more recent, um, I've used uh, Colossians 3.12, which, which starts like this. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience and you know when it says put on them what what I, and I always make reference to the people that are standing up here and say you know all your bridesmaids and grooms you know groomsmen they didn't just pick those outfits up today that that has been thought out for a long time and when you're talking about love you think out for a long time what you're going to wear and and you pick it out and you can kind of lay it out such as it is either on the on the on the bed frame of your soul or or whatever you envision that as but then you have to wear it you have to put it on and you have to wear it. and those are the clothes we wear in marriage those are the clothes we wear in our family those are the clothes we show our families because for the Christians love is the way we relate to others and this is inclusive of all human relationships and so this practical help for your closest relationships and family today and I'm going to walk right through 1 Corinthians and I'm actually going to do it fairly briskly so pay attention stay awake sorry for a couple of you wake up all right time is almost near wake thou sleepest here that comes but I'm going to give a simple list of what love is not and what love is so I'm going to start with the negative so we can finish with the positive love does not envy Love does not harbor feelings of jealousy. Love does not say, you love me more, or you love them more than me. You you love them more than me. One of my kids used to say it all the time. And I'd say, well, of course I do, because you act like this. (laughs) I'm joking, I'm joking. They're both watching through there, so. JK, all right. um. (laughs) But it, also, <laughs> but it also comes out in little things like this. There's a guy that uh, I heard this uh, not too long ago from a fellow. He works construction, so he can't take his work home, right? I mean, he has to go to where his work is. And he, he was talking about to, to his spouse and says, yeah, I'm out there busting it, you know, and it's cold, rainy, hot, whatever. And it must be nice just to be able to go to work in your PJs because she works from home, you know, and digital stuff and only has to, you know, business the top half, Right? But we, love is not jealous. It's never jealous. And, and, and love does not envy. And love does not boast. We don't, in, in when we love someone, we don't brag about ourselves all the time. We don't make ourselves better than we are. We, you know, because bragging really is, I've, if I've watched people boast, really the agenda behind that, the aim is to raise themselves to such a point by simply putting others down. You know, because you never feel bad about yourself if you raise yourself up and push others down. You know, you can say fr- sentences that I've heard, like saying, I, wake, I make way more money than he does. I make way more money than him. And I've heard this sentence, not in this church, but close by, where, where one of the people I know said, you know, I lost 50 pounds. And he was supposed to do that too. I guess he just doesn't have the willpower I have. It's like puffing ourselves up. Love does not boast. And love does not act arrogantly. Love never exudes, I'm better than you. I'm more than you. I'm more essential than you. Love never says, why can't you get this right? Do I have to show you every time? I had to tell you a story because my wife's wonderful. I did not learn how to make oatmeal until I was 40, I know. (laughs) And I could not do it right. I mean, it's water, oats, and fire, right? Right? And I still was throwing oatmeal away for a few days until finally she pushed the easy button for me. Taught me how. But never once she, did she say, do I have to show this every time? Can't you get it right? And 
when, when a person says that, that's, that's belittling. If you say, can't you get this right? Do I have to show you this every single time? Love does not a- act arrogantly. Just because you know something somebody else doesn't know, you don't act arrogantly about that. Love does not dishonor others. Love never rudely exposes things that are considered, or at least by considered the one that's getting things shared about themselves, that are confidential. So I'm in a restaurant true story most of mine are <laughs> I said most fair enough right I'm in a restaurant and a fellow is um, not getting his order ready fast enough to please the woman he's with which appeared to be his wife or his, you know the, his partner anyway and uh, she says to the waitress making fun of him for not being able to make a decision she said, and I'm there. I'm just in Chili's minding my own business, you see. Kind of, mostly. And she says to the waitress, he's so insecure, he can't even fall asleep without calling his mom. You see a person just shrink when someone says that like that. You know, don't, call, don't embarrass your kids. Don't, don't, don't embarrass your... I mean, it's not loving to, 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 to put your... You know, to, to rudely share confidential information that your kids or whatnot or your husband or spouse has shared. Love does not dishonor others, and love does not insist on its own way. It, it seeks first, not itself, but others. I, some of you guys are brand new. I want to tell you the truth. If, you're, if your husband or wife ever walks into the room, you know, and you're like setting up to play video games or make a puzzle of the Grand Canyon or anything else you like that's not what I'm going to say next. If they ever walk into the room and say, hey, were you thinking about going to the store tonight? Just so you know, the answer is yes. (laughs) Yeah, I was just thinking I should go to the store tonight. Oh, good. Well, if you're there, could you pick up this or that and you know you know used to write a list now it's a text right so you get to the store you're like okay beans almond milk charmin toilet paper there's five kinds of charmin (laughs) what kind do i like what kind do you like the kind with the blue label awesome there's two with blue labels (laughs) then the picture comes right (laughs) But, but I just want, I, you just need to know, especially if you're newly married, get men or women. If, if your spouse says, are you thinking about going to the store? You just, I was just looking for my keys. Because love, love does not insist on its own way. Love goes. And, and love does not get angry easy. Okay, this is dangerous, what I'm gonna do next. Now, I don't know if you know this, but if, how many of you live inside? <laughs> All right, most of you. Okay, so inside your home, there are these things called drawers, right? Our kitchen is ripe with drawers, as is our bedroom. And I don't know if you know this about drawers, but when you pull one open and then push it, you can push it all the way until it stops. <laughs> you don't have to leave them open two inches. It, it's not a law or anything. You don't have to expose that thing. And, and in our home, that one of us <laughs> leaves the drawers open. So I, I will sometimes say, hey, you know, these drawers go all the way shut. And lovingly she says, and grown men can take the change out of their pants before they throw them in the laundry. So, <laughs> <laughs> see, you get cheered. They just cheer me, you know. So, so there's no need getting angry about the little things. There's no need getting easily uh, irritated because anger in the family likely has its roots somewhere else. You can't be, I'm never mad about drawers. You know, she's not really mad about change unless it ruins the dryer or something. But <laughs> love does not get angry easily. And love does not keep a record of wrongs. I I heard a comedian once say, when my wife and I start arguing, she never gets hysterical, but she always gets historical. Yeah? 
She brings up everything I've ever done wrong. And when you're record keeping like that, forgiveness is absent in record keeping because you have to understand that if, you're compa if you are fully Christian and you confess your sins, Jesus says, I drop the charges. So that means in marriage, I have to drop them too and you have to drop them as well. Record keeping can only be for one purpose and that's retaliation, right? You only keep a record so you're loaded when the next argument comes. That's the only reason. It, it may sometimes feel like the same argument again, but it's not. Love does not keep a record of wrongs, and love does not delight in the evil. Love doesn't do mean things. I mean, for goodness sake, if you're married or if you have kids or if you are a kid, we all know how to hurt our spouse. We all know how to hurt our children. We all know how to hurt the people that we know and care about. We know how to hurt our parents, whoever it is. And deploying those things, pushing those buttons, that's not love. It's evil. And love does not delight in evil. So there's the things I believe, according to the scriptures, those right out of 1 Corinthians 13. I couldn't draw out that list myself. All those things Paul tells us are negative. That is not what love is. So what does he say and what do we advocate that love is? Love does exercise patience. I want to tell you, anybody that's got a little gray in their hair will tell you young families when things are tough, you know, like the child won't go to sleep. We'll say this little sentence and I need you to embrace it and drink it in. Days are long, years are short. Amen, grandparents? Days are long. They won't go to bed. They've got a little fever. They're throwing a fit. Same with husbands and wives, of course. But days are short. Days are long. Years are, are short. Embrace the fact that neither you nor your children nor your significant other is perfect. In a family, patience is loving. Patience is loving. Love does show kindness. Intentionally, we all need to do kind things and thoughtful things for people, and they have to be practical. Do what he or she or they do not enjoy doing, especially if it's no big deal to you. Do those things because every day, yeah, you can, you can buy a cruise and say, man, that's excited, we're going on a Disney cruise or whatever. And guess what? Guess what? Kindness in every day in thousands of countless ordinary moments are probably more valuable to the people you're around because it shows consistency. Because I believe in, when we talk about the conflict in the Middle East, I believe that kindness can transform families and it can even transform the world community from non-loving or unloving to loving. Love always rejoices in the truth. It agrees with what's true in God's word and it happily lives in that truth. And love always protects. I, I had this most beautiful experience uh, just this week, one, one of our beloved long-term members uh, passed away, and I was talking to her sons on Zoom, and uh, they said this about their mom, which I thought was just absolutely wonderful. She said, they said, she always made our home a safe place. That's, that's a magnificent protection. When we came home, no matter what was going on, in the community, no matter what even maybe mistakes we had made, what, whatever, you know, uh, malfeasance we had done, when we came home, we were safe and secure. We as Christians, as, as parents, as, as, as uh, spouses, w w whatever, we are to secure and continually provide physical, spiritual, and emotional safety for all. Love is patient and love trusts, always trusts. It confidently believes and stakes their lives on God. It confidently believes that the word and intentions of those in our family are true. Are they always? When I was given mine to my parents, no, not always. But we have to have confidence and faith in the people uh, that when, when, we, when we trust others that their intentions are right. Love always hopes it waits in joyful expectation for God, regardless of the situation. Because, you know, let's be honest, sometimes in the family, we are in an absolute mudstorm, right? I mean, the egg hits the fan, and holy cow, 
And, and yet, when we're, when we're in love with the Lord and when we're in love with our family, we, we, we keep our hope there and we wait in joyful expectation for our family member or our spouse to be transformed by the power of God. And love endures all things. I was surprising. I was watching a football game last week, right? And they said about one of those players that was playing, they said, boy, that kid's got no quit in him. That's endurance. You never give up. You never give in. And the Christian, the person that's in love with God, believes that God will never quit on us. He will never quit on you. He will never quit on me. And therefore, there is no need to run away. We can stay. And we can stay long. Fighting for your family means putting these things into practice. These and probably a plethora of many others. Words without actions are just noise. We say lots of things, especially those of you that are parents. We say a lot of things to our kids, and they listen to that, but they watch what you do. Do those two things match? Because actions are what validate love. Love comes with authentication every single day. So... Genuine love disciplines its behavior. behavior. Not to be perfect, because we're not. None of us here anyway. But to constantly make progress in doing what is loving and stop doing what's unloving. And we start by living those things in our family and then towards everyone else that God brings into our lives. We fight for your family because God loves your family. Let us pray. God, we pray for all these things. We pray for patience and kindness and endurance. We pray that you might let us set down those things that would cause us to go away from you. We ask that we might practice this perfect definition of love in our lives and that it might spill out onto the others in which we come in contact. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.